There was a book several years back on the topic of the Buddhist attitude toward desire. The author was making the point that the problem is that we cling to the objects of our desires. But that if you could have a desire without clinging to the object, you'd be fine. Of course, that's a recipe for a serial sex offender. You keep on desiring and you have one object, then you don't care about it anymore, and then you find another object, don't care about that anymore. The author had everything backwards. The desire itself is the problem. The fascination with thinking about sensual objects. That's what we cling to. The particular object may change. Sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensations. And you look at the mind and it runs all over the place. It's not so much attached to the objects as it is to the planning, the fantasizing. And even there, the, the plans and the fantasies may change. Clinging doesn't mean that you hold to one fantasy or one plan. It means you hold on to this activity. The same holds for the other types of clinging. Clinging to views, clinging to habits and practices, clinging to doctrines of the self. Clinging to views doesn't mean you have a fixed view that you hold on to all the time. You hold on to one view, then you change it, and you hold on to the next one. You change that and hold on to another one. So you can't avoid view clinging by just wandering around with different views or saying that you don't have any particular view you hold on, on to all the time. The fact that you hold on to one long enough to base the an action on it, that's clinging enough. Same with habits and practices. You can change your habits and practices, your ideas of what you should and shouldn't do. Believing one thing today, another thing tomorrow. It's still clinging. And the same with doctrines of the self. You can have different ideas of who you are. And you go through the day with different ideas of who you are. Sometimes you identify with your body, sometimes with your feelings, sometimes with your perceptions, your thoughts, any combination of these. If you were to draw a picture of your sense of self, it would be like an amoeba changing shape all the time. And it all still set, counts as clinging, because the Buddha is not telling you, wander around with your ideas, wander around with your ideas of what should and shouldn't be done, what the world is like, who you are. Because it's hard to follow a, a path of practice that would amount to anything if everything was so shifty. So you can't avoid clinging by changing your mind all the time. You're just turning into a, a serial clinger. Of course, what do you do? You need to have some views about the world, some views about what is appropriate and what's not. Who you are in, ter in terms of whether you're capable of making a change in the world, making a change in your experience. You have to have certain views about these things. And you have to hold to them if you want to behave in a consistent manner. We can focus on a goal and work all the way to that goal. So the solution is not changing your views. The solution is finding the views that get you to act in the right way and get you to act in the right way consistently until you reach the threshold. This is what the Buddha calls the karma that leads to the end of karma. And it's going to require firmly held right views, 
and devotion to skillful precepts and skillful practices, and a consistent view of yourself as being responsible, of wanting to put it into suffering, and believing in yourself that you can do this. At the same time realizing that you're the one who has to be responsible. So the way out of clinging actually is holding on to certain views, certain habits, certain sense of ways of defining yourself that are skillful. This kind of holding on is part of the Buddhist strategy. You have to remember that discernment is always strategic. The Buddha is not just as describing things. For the sake of the description, he's telling you, think in these ways up to this point, and then you're going to have to abandon those, those ways. But in the meantime, hold on and be consistent. Now, the only clinging that the Buddha doesn't leave room for in the path is clinging to sensuality. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to reject all sensual pleasures. Remember, sensuality is your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures, planning for them, fantasizing about them. But the pleasures themselves, the ones that will be in accordance with the path and not in accordance with the path, in some cases, the Buddha says across the board, any sensual pleasure that involves breaking the precepts is out of bounds. There are other pleasures that some people find that they indulge in them and there's no problem. Other people have a problem. This is going to be an individual matter. And notice this in Thailand. There are some monks who lived in a monastery in the relative comfort of the monastery, and they were able to practice perfectly fine. Other monks needed the, the hardships of the forest in order to become heedful. So this will be an individual matter. As the Buddha said, any pleasure that accords with the Dharma, any pleasure that you notice that as you follow that pleasure, skillful states develop in the mind, and skillful states fall away. That pleasure is perfectly fine. It's the ones where if you indulge in that pleasure and skillful states deteriorate and unskillful states grow, that's a pleasure you've got to do away with. So you've got to look into your own mind and be honest about that sensual pleasure. But the other forms of clinging, the Buddha gives you skillful ways of clinging for the purpose of the path. Realizing that you'll have to let go at some point. And John Mahabhu gives a nice analogy. He says it's like climbing a ladder. You hold on to one rung, and then you hold on to the next one. You don't let go of the first rung until the, your other hand is on a higher rung. Then you let go and you stretch that hand up even higher. Once you firmly grasp that rung, then you let go of the, the second one, and so on up. Say you're taking it up to a roof. When you get off the ladder and onto the roof, that's when you let go of the ladder entirely. But until that point, you've got to hold on. Or as Ananda commented to the Buddha, the Buddha went through a list of the different stages of concentration, starting with the fourth John and going higher, and talking about how when you get to the highest level of concentration, you realize there's a pure state of equanimity. And as long as you're attached to that equanimity, you're going to not be able to gain awakening. But if you learn to see that it too is in constant stressful not self, learn to let go.
then you can be free. And then Nana's comment was the Buddha was teaching how to get across the river going from one clinging to the next. So you will be clinging as you follow the path. And the more consistent you are in clinging to a right view, the better. Our problem is we hold on it to sometimes and then change our minds other times. And so watch out for the, the justifying voice that says, well, I'm letting go, I'm showing that I'm not clinging. That's not the case. You've just gone back to cling to something that's not as skillful. Then you get stuck in what John Lee talks about when he describes the two paths, and saying that our problem is that we follow the right path sometimes and then the not right path other times. And as a result, we don't really get anywhere. If you want to get someplace, you hold on to the right path all the way. So watch for this tendency of the mind to want to switch around. And remember, there's no justification in the Dharma for it. And especially watch out for that voice that says, well, I'm learning how to be unattached. That's very seductive. And it sounds like it's got the Dharma on its side. This is one of the things we have to watch out for all along. Is that the defilements can begin to sound like Dharma sometimes. They can take a Dharma teaching that's true and beneficial, but it's not the right time. What may not even be true, it sounds right. But if you look at it carefully, you begin to realize that something's off. All this comes down to that tendency that a John Chan noted. He said, when you really look at your mind, one of the first things you realize is how much it lies to itself. You can take the Dharma and turn it into non-Dharma, and yet think it's still got the Dharma. So remember this, clinging doesn't mean you just hold on to something fixedly. It means you hold on to something long enough to make a decision about what to do, based on your idea of what the world is, what should and shouldn't be done, who you are, what the extent to which you benefit from that action. And if you keep changing your views about this, John Lee's image is of paddling around in a little little lake. You paddle and you paddle and paddle, and you think you're going to get someplace, but you've just been paddling in circles. You want to get clear about right view, clear about what the precepts and practice of concentration are all about, clear about your abilities to follow the path, and clear about your desire to really want to take it all the way. When you're clear about these things, you hold on to them and take them all the way. That way your actions will be consistent. Then go in, in one direction, the direct path. And it's the direct path that takes you where you want to go. <laughs>